And scripture speaks to all of the prodigals, sons and daughters, like I am. Comes from Luke 15, 19, and 20. A little bit before 19, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, 19, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants, 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, he ran fell on his neck, and kissed him. That's beautiful. That's what he did for us. Amen. And 19, verse 10. Along the same way the Lord expounds. For the Son of Man, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Last Sabbath, we explored the encounter that Jesus had with Nicodemus, an example of Jesus calling a good person to become a child of God. This week, we're kind of going to the polar opposite, if you will. We're in John chapter 4, and as we work our way through John chapter 4, we'll be seeing how Jesus deals with anyone who acts badly. As I was working on the sermon, I tried to figure out which of my many personal examples of acting badly to share with you. I seem to have had many to pick from. Let me take you back to Labor Day of 1993. It was probably the zenith of my Air Force career. I was a squadron commander, which may not mean a lot to you, but... There's about 150 officers throughout the Air Force that are squadron commanders. It's a big deal. And I have arrived. <laughs> so Labor Day weekend comes and my administrative sergeant in the squadron office said, Colonel, are you running in the race? And I said, well, I hadn't thought about it. He says, I signed you up. And you don't want to kind of put cold water on a sergeant who's showing initiative. But the race was Saturday morning. So I went. Because I wanted to. Years later, I came across this quote. It's from Be Like Jesus, page 58. Lift your toes up, because this will strike home. Any person who willfully breaks one commandment does not, in spirit and truth, keep any of them. It is not the greatness of the act of disobedience that constitutes sin, but the fact of variation from God's expressed will in the least particular thing. For this shows there is yet communion between the soul and sin. For honest... I bet you we all can think of a time when we willfully broke at least one of the commandments. So I think what Jesus does with the Samaritan woman is a good review of what he will do for anyone, all of us, who act badly. So if you're in John chapter 4, we'll get to our first verse in a moment, but let me set The background. Even by John chapter 4, Jesus has gotten the attention of the Pharisees. And he hasn't gotten it in a good way. They're not real impressed with this young man. Matter of fact, they're really aggravated with this young man. Therefore, Jesus leaves Judea and makes his way to Galilee. John chapter 4, verse 4. But he needed to go through Samaria. That seems like a simple, straightforward verse with not a lot of theological importance to it. 
until you stop and think about the word needed. Jesus needed to go to Samaria. Now, if you understand the culture, you know that there was a prescribed, acceptable, well-beaten path around Samaria for the Jews to take. Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. The Samaritans had become half-breeds. Jews that had become traitors to their gods by marrying the Gentiles during the Assyrian captivity. So the pure Jews considered them unclean and traitors. They had acted badly. So they wouldn't even talk with them or walk in their land. And yet verse 4 says, Jesus needed to go there. Jesus needs to go there because there's a woman he wants to talk to. And our scripture reading tells us why he needs to go there. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The first thing Jesus does with those who act badly is he goes after them. And by the way, just because you act badly doesn't make you a bad person. It just means you act badly. If you act like a worm, it doesn't make you a worm, it just makes you act like a worm. You see, Jesus understands us. Us humans, we sometimes forget that. Jesus needs to go to a woman who's acting badly because the first thing he does with all of us who act badly is to seek after us. So it's about noontime and Jesus arrives at Sychar, I think, a town in Samaria. He has walked for two days and he rests outside the city walls by the well that Jacob made. Although Jesus is completely God, he's also completely human. And after walking for two days, he's rather tired. So the disciples go into the town to get some food. And while they're gone, the Samaritan woman comes to get, well, get water at the well. Now... If you've ever been in the desert, you know that sometimes the sun can be rather intense. Therefore, most of the people in the city that need water from the well come at the beginning of the day or the end of the day when the sun is a little less intense. Not this woman. She comes at lunchtime, the hottest time of the day. My mind, she comes then because she's trying to avoid the continuous ridicule she gets from the respectable women of the town. The Samaritan woman wouldn't even be accepted in worship. She has acted so badly. And yet, she's more than welcomed in the presence of the Son of God. I don't care how badly we have acted, Jesus seeks after us and welcomes interacting with us. The woman thought she was going to Jacob well because she needed some water. In reality, she had an appointment with the Son of God. And I'm here to tell you that you have an appointment with the Son of God today, just like that woman did. When people act badly, Jesus needs to seek them out. And he does that in some kind of strange and mysterious ways. As I found out as I was running that 10-kilometer race back in 1993. Jesus seeks us out 
Once he's got our attention, he begins to attract us. John chapter 4, verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Drop down to verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Be right back. <coughs> I tried to give this cold to my wife. And although I was successful at that, I guess there's more of it still left over. She's home in bed and not very happy with me. I don't know why I share those things. Verses 7 to 9. We don't begin to appreciate what Jesus is doing. Jesus is breaking all known societal rules. The rule is, you don't even talk to a Samaritan man, let alone a Samaritan woman. And especially not her. Jesus does. And he does it for a very specific reason. Keep your finger in John chapter 4 and go over to Romans chapter 2. I want you to be in Romans chapter 2 verse 11. Romans chapter 2 verse 11. There is no partiality with God. There are only two groups of people in God's mind, saved and not saved. And he loves both of them. He loves us even when we act badly. So he seeks out the woman and now he's interacting with her. And he's beginning to attract her, to draw her, if you will. John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman tells Jesus, The well is deep and you don't have any container to draw the water. So where are you going to get this thing called living water from? In my mind, she kind of has an attitude. Jesus doesn't directly answer that specific request. Instead, he tells her something she needs to hear. Verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water, meaning the well, will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. <coughs> We've all heard that verse, but maybe we don't understand the full context of what Jesus is saying. This water, this living water that Jesus is offering to the Samaritan woman can refer, as you know, to salvation. It comes from Isaiah 12, verses 2 through 6. But it also can uh, refer to the Holy Spirit. That comes from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. That says, For I will pour water on them who are thirsty. And floods on the dry ground, I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offspring. So this living water can be salvation and it can be the Holy Spirit. Now we always go back to Jacob's well because we always get thirsty. Matter of fact, I have three bottles of water up here because I get thirsty and Paul takes good care of me. And when I get home this afternoon, I'll probably have some more water. But the water that Jesus is talking about will quench the spiritual thirst by providing salvation. And it also becomes a perpetual spring that wells up in us the Holy Spirit that provides for us 
all of our spiritual needs. So this living water is significantly different than what the woman is thinking about. Look at John 4, verse 15. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, give me this water that I, I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. She's still thinking it's the physical water. And she doesn't like coming in the middle of the day because it's hot. And she doesn't like coming to the well at all because all those other women give her a hard time. So she wants this living water, although she doesn't really understand what it is. So like the woman, when we, woman, when we act badly, Jesus seeks after us and then he attracts us. The third thing he does is he then confronts us. The woman doesn't understand what Jesus means by living water, but it seems she wants a change in her life. And although she doesn't know it yet, she must first confront the sins in her life. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. On the surface, that sounds like, oh man, I get this stuff. This will be great. Until she realizes what Jesus just asked her to do. Jesus exposes the woman's sin to see how she will respond to it and to him. He wants her to consider her sin, her need for forgiveness and repentance. So the woman responds to Jesus in verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one with whom you now live is not your husband. In that you have spoken truly. I want you to understand that Jesus acknowledges where she is. Jesus acknowledges her partial truth and in a sense commends her for getting that far. But then he fills in the rest of the story. Keep your finger where you're at and flip over to Hebrews chapter 4. Jesus always knows the rest of the story. Hebrews chapter 4, look with me at verse 13. Hebrews 4, 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Jesus confronts the woman with her sin. She responds, acknowledges part of it. He provides the rest of the story. And I want you to think about how he does that. He doesn't accuse her of any wrongdoing. Nor does he excuse any of her wrongdoing. He just lays it out there. Here's what's happening in your life. Because it's up to her to deal with her sin. When we act badly, Jesus does the same thing. He seeks after us. He tries to draw us to him. But then there's this thing called sin. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and just like the woman, we got to do something with it. Jesus knows that she's really kind of just trying to fulfill the social need to be loved and accepted. Jesus is willing to do that. But first and foremost, she must confess and repent of her sin. Because that sin is that thing that gets in the way of a sinner's relationship with the Savior. Look at verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. <coughs> Verse 20. 
verse 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. By calling him a prophet, the woman admits that Jesus is right. Yeah, I got more issues to deal with. But then she quickly tries to change the subject. When the spotlight gets too hot, we always try to divert it someplace else. How about we have a discussion on where the proper place to worship is? Because I don't want the spotlight on me anymore. Jesus doesn't fall for that. He explains to her that the real issue isn't where we worship, but how we worship. Verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus brought a change to how people worship God the Father. By this time in Jewish theology, or at least in their practice, it's just ritualistic behavior. I got to go to this feast, I got to get a lamb, take it to the altar, slaughter, sprinkle the blood, go home. It's all ritualistic. Habitual behavior with no meaning behind it. And just so you know, the word translated worship in the Old Testament and the New Testament means to bow down in deference. Prostrate yourself on the floor, in the dirt, in the dust, like you remember Moses doing, some of the other guys. <coughs> it's the idea of showing reverence and submission. Where you do that isn't as important to God as us doing that. So worshiping in accordance with God's word means that we must offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That should be a familiar term to you. If not, turn over to Romans chapter 12, where Paul kind of helps us understand this term, living sacrifice. It's not where we worship, but how we worship. That's important to God. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. A living sacrifice. Sounds contradictory by definition. A sacrifice is something I take to the temple and the priest kill it. And then they do something with the blood. And yet Paul is telling me I have to be a living sacrifice. That's a little confusing. Especially if he lived in the first century. Because I'm really knowledgeable how to get the lamb without blemish, take it to the temple, have the priest do their thing, and then I can go home. But now, I have to be a living sacrifice. I've often thought that it probably would be easier to die for Christ than to live for Christ. I mean, you only got to get courage once. Go through it once and you're done. But a living sacrifice, I got to do that for the rest of my life. Every moment of every day, I have to bow down Show reverence and submission to God. Couldn't I just be a martyr and get it over with? And I think back in my 10 kilometer race on Labor Day, I certainly was failing in this true act of worship. I was out there running for my ego. I had arrived. I'm the commander. I'm the leader of the troops. i got to be out there with my men and women. And yeah, don't worry about what God says. I'll deal with that later. Biblical worship is bowing down to God in tribute with total dedication, devotion, and compliance. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And if you were listening to the prayer conference debrief, you know this worship thing isn't supposed to be some sad, it's the Sabbath, okay, let's get through the day. And soon the sun will set and I can go shopping and I can do all those fun things I want. I can watch TV. I can play with my friends. But I got to get through the drudgery of the Sabbath. That's not how it's supposed to be at all. Find the 100th Psalm. Verses 2 through 5. Serve the Lord with gladness, it says in Psalms 100, verse 2. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his court with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Jesus seeks after those who act badly. He attracts those who act badly. He then confronts them about their sin. Jesus is interacting with this woman as an example of how he interacts with us because all of us have acted badly. As Jesus talked about this new kind of worship, in my mind, the Samaritan woman probably begins to think about the coming Messiah. John chapter 4, verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. The Samaritans believed that the Messiah would be a reformer and change the status quo. I guess in that they were right. He did. Samaritans thought that the Messiah was going to change and resolve this conflict of whether you worship on a mountain or at the temple. So they were looking forward to him on many levels. But the next verse, I guarantee you, floors this woman's mind. Verse 26, Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. If you know your scriptures, this is the first time he has made that pronouncement. The first time the Son of God says to the world, I am the Son of God. He says to a sinful Samaritan woman. Not a member of the Sanhedrin. Not a Pharisee. Not even a Jew. A half-breed. Her mind must be in total confusion. She has met the Messiah. He's talked with her, and he hasn't condemned her. If God in the flesh accepts me without denouncing me, then I must be okay, she thinks in her heart. And all of us who act badly can think the same thing. Jesus needed to travel through Samaria to find one lost sheep, a woman who is ready to believe in him, even though she had acted badly. Today, when we act badly, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, seeks us, attracts us, confronts us about our sin, and I save the best to last. Then he stands ready to forgive us. Notice I said he stands ready to forgive us. Jesus doesn't do anything without our permission. As the woman is kind of frantic in her thinking, the disciples return. Now she's okay with Jesus at this point because he's kind of different. He's strange. He's weird. But those guys... They're Jews. 
I'm out of here. She returns to the city, the town, the village. Verse 27. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. You're not supposed to do that, they said to themselves. The woman then left her water pot, verse 28, and went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Now, pay attention and notice what happens here. It's the middle of the day, hottest point of the day. The sun is hot. That speaker is loud, so I'll go over here. She goes to get water. Jesus offers living water. She drops the pot of water she thought she needed to go back and talk to all those people that make fun of her and tell them what she learned and what they need to learn. If we're not careful, we would have held on to that water pot because that's important to us. Not her. She drops that. This is irrelevant. So she goes back into the town and tells them that this guy hasn't condemned me but has forgiven me and accepts me even though I have acted badly in the past. Jesus then teaches his disciples about the spiritual fields are ripe for harvest. That's verses 34 through 38. And back in the town, this forgiven woman is telling everybody about what just happened. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in Jesus because of the word, word, thank you, Of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. He walks into polluted territory. He breaks every rule by talking to the woman. And if that's not bad enough, he stays put for 48 hours. Many come to Jesus. How does Jesus relate to us when we act badly? He seeks after us. He attracts us back. He confronts us with our sin. And then he forgives us. And we should respond like the woman. We should go tell everybody... What he's done for us. Unlike Fernando, I'll tell you the rest of the story. That's a little plug for his meeting in a minute. It's Labor Day, 1993. I'm a squadron commander. I'm a lieutenant colonel. And I have arrived. (coughs) There's only one more step in my military career before I'm a general. I've already told you that didn't happen, but that's another story. So I don't know if you've ever been to a road race. A 10-kilometer race is a little over six miles. I could run that in about eight and a half to nine-minute miles, depending upon how good I felt that day. So the next event's going to take about 55 minutes to an hour. And you wear these little pieces of paper on your shirt, has your number so, you know, they can publish who finished where and how fast you were and all that kind of silly stuff. And then you do some stretching. So Jack, my staff sergeant, uh, my administrative sergeant, and I are, are stretching together. And there's like, I don't know, 30 of us from the 150 people in my squadron. And we're all stretching and, you know, we're all hanging out there together and we're getting ready for this race through downtown Fort Walton Beach. Jesus seeks after those who are doing wrong and, they do, and he does that often in ways that you don't understand. So in about two minutes, the horn is going to go and, you know, 2,000 people are off running. Jack is standing right here. Almost seems like yesterday in a way. And he goes, Colonel, aren't you a Seventh-day Adventist? Because wow. 
because he and I talk about religion all the time. So I say, yes. And he just went, hmm. An hour I had to think about that, hmm. Jesus seeks after us in mysterious ways. Then when he gets your attention, he tries to attract you back to the right side of the argument. As I pondered the hmm, my mind went back to all the things God had done for me. I'm at the zenith of my military career. It takes a lot of work to get to where I had gotten. And doors had been opened that should never have been opened. I told you I told my general that I wasn't going to the officer's club with him on Friday nights. That should have ended my career. But here I am, a squadron commander. Running a race Sabbath morning. And by the way, we ran right by the Fort Walton Beach Church, which is another story. So as I ponder the hmm, my sergeant said, I'm thinking about the fact I'm a colonel in the Air Force. I'm the commander of a squadron. This is a neat time of my life. Then my mind raced through the fact that I have two really neat kids after not having kids for 10 years. And then one of them, when she was born, had a birth defect. And when she was one, she had her skull completely removed and rebuilt by the world's experts. They lived in Colorado, where I live. I could have been in Thailand, and my daughter could have had a deformed head the rest of her life. But no, God in his love and his mercy sent me to the exact team of experts to take every bone off in her skull, play j jigsaw puzzle, and pull it back together. My career is in place. My daughter is healthy. We have a son. Things are going good. And my way of saying thanks is breaking the Sabbath. I'm starting to run faster now because I want this experience to get over. And then he confronts me. By that little still voice who says, Hey, Colonel, what kind of witness are you giving to Jack? Because we're running together. <laughs> you couldn't, like, go faster and, you know, leave, let me think about something else. No, he's standing there right next to me the whole time. What kind of witness am I giving to Jack and the other people in my squadron who know I'm a Seventh-day Adventist? The end of the race came, thankfully. And I told them that my beeper went off. This was before cell phones. So he, had, he always had to have a little beeper in case the world ended. I told them my beeper went off. It didn't. I just had to get out of there. And on the drive home, I rededicated my life to God. Because he sought me out when I was acting badly. He attracted me. By helping me remember all the good things he's done. And then he said, hey, this behavior's got to stop. Sin can't continue if we're going to have a loving relationship. And then he waited to decide, for me to decide, what I was going to do with my bad behavior. That's what he did with the Samaritan woman. That's what he did with me. That's what he will do with you. I don't care what the bad behavior is. If you claim 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. Amen. doesn't matter if you are Nicodemus, the good person, or the Samaritan woman, the bad person. Whether you've acted properly or poorly, Jesus wants to have a saving relationship with each and every one of us. Amen. Two weeks from the day, at least two people are going to get baptized. It's doubled since I told you that last week. There are at least two others in this room who are ready for baptism. 
if they want it. You too know who you are. So why I won't look at you, I'll just wait for Shelly Ann to come and have our closing hymn. And I'll go sit down. Can we all stand? Thank you, Jonathan. Can we all stand for the closing hymn, 367, Rescue the Perishing? I need to confess, at least to Dennis, and you all can just listen in. Dennis is one of the three officers of the conference that hired me in spite of all my misgivings. So you can either thank him or whatever, but Dennis is the man. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that regardless of our actions, you love us unconditionally. And whether we are good or have acted badly, you want to have a saving relationship with us. And so my prayer, Lord, is that the Holy Spirit would descend into each of our hearts, that the Holy Spirit might convict us of that thing that is keeping us away from a relationship with you. Give courage to those who need to come forward for baptism, Give courage and strength to those who need to change a behavior so that they can have that saving relationship with you. Continue to pour out your spirit on us individually and collectively as your church here at Auburn. May we live in a way that brings glory and honor to your name. And in some small way, may our actions enhance your kingdom that Jesus might come soon and take us home, is my prayer in his name. Amen.